Good morning. We welcome you this morning as we gather to worship the Lord on this day. Uh, it's a beautiful day to, to come together and to worship. Let's look to him in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we gather on this day, we recognize, Lord, that we are gathered here today because in your love you entered our world. You entered a world that was dark and uh, torn, but you have shed your light into the world. And Lord, we worship you this morning. We ask that your Holy Spirit would enlighten our eyes, Lord, that you would open our eyes and our hearts, Lord, to receive from you. To receive, O oh Lord, into our lives the grace and the mercy of God that you have shown us by coming into our world. Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and we give you thanks, Lord. We pray that you would be with us this morning. Minister to each one who is gathered here by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Um, for announcements, um, Tuesday we have Bible study at 10. On Wednesday is our monthly prayer meeting. And then next week, worship service. Call to worship. The ministry of acceptance. So from now on, regard one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do no longer. 2 Corinthians 5.16. Growing up, I considered my older brother Cole the embodiment of cool. I would often wish I could be like him. Just about everyone seemed to accept and like him. One summer, I stayed a few weeks with my brother. While we were at a restaurant with his friends, Cole said, I think John would fit into the group well. These words are some of the most meaningful words ever spoken to me. My cool brother was telling me I was accepted, and his cool friends agreed with him. You may feel the sting of rejection, but the good news is that Jesus doesn't care what you've done or where you've been. He knows all your secrets, and he still accepts you. In his ministry of acceptance, Jesus sees every person as an individual, valuable, important, and created by God. When you begin your ministry of acceptance, what will that look like in your life? prayer this morning and uh, one of the things we, we want to do is give thanks uh, this is my last Sunday uh, because next week as Julie said the new pastor uh, is coming and uh, we want to give thanks that God has provided uh, that God has uh, led someone who feels led to come to to Blackstone uh, who the church feels comfortable with and we need to give thanks to the Lord for that this morning and I thank you. Uh, I have always been grateful uh, over the years uh, for uh, this church is, you know, one of the things I heard long ago, that pastors shape a church, but churches also shape a pastor. Keep that in mind as, as Joe comes, that the church is, has an important role in shaping the pastor. And I've always been grateful uh, for my experiences here over the years and how I was shaped for ministry uh, by the congregation that was here in Blackstone back then and uh, in the last couple of years as well. So we are thankful uh, for that. And we are thankful that a new pastor is coming who's excited to come and, and hopefully uh, through the Lord, because it is always in the Lord, uh, that uh, how, how does it go in the Psalms? Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So we want to give thanks this morning. Let's look to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we are grateful for all the blessings that you have given us. Lord, sometimes uh, when we are struggling uh, and we are going through a dark period, we forget those blessings. But Lord, they are new every morning. Your mercies and your grace, Lord, uh, great is your faithfulness. Lord, we are thankful this morning for your faithfulness to this community, to this church, Lord, that has had a long history in, in this place. We are thankful for your faithfulness, Lord, in providing for a pastor who is excited and feels called to come. Lord, we pray that you would be with him, Lord, and that you would touch his life, empower him, O oh Lord, uh, for what lies ahead. 
We pray that you would give increase to his ministry, Lord, that here uh, you would bless his work here, you would bless his labors. And we pray, O oh Lord Jesus, that you would give increase uh, to this community. Lord, one that has been uh, long and faithful in, your, in this place and in this town. We pray your blessing upon us. And Lord, we lift up all the burdens that we, uh, we have uh, that we carry upon our heart. Lord, we pray for Barbara as she goes through a very difficult time with chemo. Uh, Lord, we pray for her healing touch. We pray your spirit would touch her and sustain her in this time. Lord, we pray for her family, for Mark and, and Jared uh, and grandkids as well. Lord, that you would be with them as they go through this time with her. And Lord, we pray for Mark's granddaughter who has uh, this injury, Lord, and uh, with so many auditions and, and uh, an important time in her life, we pray for sustaining power of your mercy and your grace and for your healing, almighty God. And Lord, we pray for a Mark's colleague as well, this man James, who is seeking a position. We pray that you would open a door, Lord, that uh, he would uh, find employment and that you would uh, provide with uh, Mark an opportunity to share his faith uh, as well. Lord, we pray for those who are sick among us. We remember Sharon and Chrissy uh, who have been afflicted with COVID. It seems that COVID uh, is not ever going to leave us, but we pray for their healing. We pray for your touch upon them, almighty God. We pray for Nancy as well as uh, she has struggled this week with illness. We pray that you would heal her, O oh Lord, and sustain her uh, through this time. Lord, we pray uh, for Mary's uh, nephew uh, and his family as they go through a very difficult time. Lord, there is so much, uh, marriage can be a very difficult place, Lord. It can be a greatly rewarding place, but at times it can become difficult. Give them the endurance, Lord, to press through this time of struggle and to come out on the other side, Lord, healed and renewed in their love and commitment to one another. And Lord, we remember our brother in law as well, Bob. We pray that you would be with him and his family as they go through this time of loss. We pray that uh, you would give him a good uh, spirit and that with his, his family would uh, have an opportunity to share their love uh, with him. And Lord, we remember all the darkness of the world that we live in. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, O oh Lord. Uh, the more we read about the reports of what has happened, the, the, the more we are astounded at, at the brutality of human being to human being. We pray, O oh God, for your peace to descend upon our world. Lord, we begin a new year, and we ask, O oh Lord, uh, that your peace would find a place in our hearts in this time of, uh, of uh, change, Lord. And Lord, we ask all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is taken uh, from Isaiah uh, chapter 43 and then Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, first, the Isaiah text. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. You do not perceive it. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but we are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for you. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. 
For God, Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for the, themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word to us. Your word given for our instruction and that we might find life. Lord, I ask this morning that your spirit would guide us as we think about your words today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, tomorrow we begin a new year, 2024. And, you know, I'm just getting used to writing 2023, and I've got to change all that. And change is not easy at a certain age. Um, but the turning of the calendar is very often for a lot of people uh, a, a day of optimism, a, a day of, of resolve, uh, a new resolve that 24 will, will be a good year, resolutions are made. I have to tell you, though, I am not an optimist. Uh, by nature, I am a person for whom the glass is half empty. This week, uh, well, not last week, we had uh, a flood uh, in our neighborhood. And, of course, I got water in my basement. That's been happening for a long time from time to time. And after, when cleaning up, I had to go into, under the stairs, there's a, um, a, a crawl space that's boxed in and you can't see it. I crawled under there and wiped up all the dampness and cleaned it out. And then when I looked around the corner, I saw a wall that was covered with mold. And of course, being someone for whom the glass is half empty, I saw it as catastrophic. I called the insurance company. They told me, okay, we'll send an, uh, uh, an adjuster out. You can also call a mold restoration company and see what, so I did. But for the three days in between the time that it took for the restoration guy to come out, I imagined the worst. I imagine all the flooring in the cellar being ripped up, carpets, tile, everything. And for those of you who have been to my study know that I would have a lot of work to do to move my books. Well, the guy came out yesterday morning and he looked at what I had. He says, oh, that's nothing. And he said, uh, you can clean that yourself. It's not even worth me coming out. He says, first of all, that's dormant mold. It's been there for a long time. And he's, then we talked about everything else, the rugs, and he said, don't worry about it. Uh, what you did, you're all set. You're, you know, you dried it out fast. And, and anyway, yesterday afternoon, I was from down where, oh, my house is gone. It's lost. To yesterday afternoon, I was upbeat. And then I was such a good mood yesterday. I stopped at Honeydew Donuts and had a nice coffee and donut, which I'm not supposed to do on a regular basis. But it was a good afternoon. But I am by nature someone who sees the glass half empty. In 2024, there are a lot of reasons to be pessimistic. We hear of wars and rumors of war. We hear, we, we see the divisions in our uh, American life. Uh, and, and so, by nature, I can be pessimistic. So I am not an optimist. And uh, those of you who were here when I was here years ago probably have heard that from time to time, that I am by nature a pessimist. But I am a hoper. Not an optimist, but a hoper. You see, optimism is all based on my own uh, abilities or on our abilities or on the, the fact that I anticipate that our world leaders will do the right thing. That's optimism. But you see, I'm a hoper because hope is founded not on what I can do or what our world leaders will do, but on Jesus Christ. Hope is founded on what God can do. And hope uh, is founded on the fact that regardless of what is going on around us, he is Lord. He is Lord of 
history. He is Lord of his church. He is Lord of my life. And he is Lord of all that goes on. So I recognize that, that while not being an optimist, uh, and being married to Pat over the years has tempered my pessimism some, somewhat, but being a hoper is different than being an optimist. And so this morning what I want to look at is this text in Isaiah and God's promise of doing a new thing. And then tie in 2 Corinthians a little bit and the example of Paul and how he was participating in God's new thing. And so Isaiah says, look, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up and you do not perceive it. I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. What a text. What a word that Isaiah is giving here to these people. It is a promise of newness. It is a promise that he is doing something new, that they don't quite perceive it, and that this newness is coming out of the circumstances that they, uh, they're in. And uh, it is intended to give hope to the hearers or readers of his word. Now, Hope is something that can be difficult to maintain sometimes. I, I'm rereading re a book this week that I read years, uh, a few years back uh, by a British uh, theologian uh, named Leslie Newbegin. He was a, a missionary to India uh, for some 38 years. He left in 1936 and came back in uh, 74. And this book he wrote was in 1983. And he tells how, having come back from India, he was asked numerous times, what was the biggest uh, adjustment he had to make in coming back? What, change, what had changed in India, in, in England, since he had left? And what he said, the biggest thing that he noticed was the disappearance of hope. When he left in the 30s, England was a place of self-confidence and of hope, and they could do things, they, they, they had a place. And when he came back in 1974, all that was gone. Hope had disappeared. And he ties it to the fact that the, the British had lost their story of hope, meaning they had lost their faith in Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Hope can be difficult to maintain sometimes. And the context of Isaiah's words here is exile. The people are living, of Israel are living in exile. In 587, the Babylonians had come to Jerusalem. They had broken through the walls. They had burned the temple, burned the palace, and they had deported the people from Israel to Babylon, which was about, uh, I think, about 700 miles. Everything they had, uh, their life was reduced. They had lost everything that they considered good in their life was gone. All that gave meaning to them, their reason for getting up, their identity as the people of God, the land which had been a gift of the Lord, the temple which symbolized the presence of God among them, it was all gone. They had been in exile for 70 years. And the frame of mind that they were in, in exile, is captured by Isaiah in chapter 40, verse 27. He says, the people of Israel are saying, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. You ever been there? Where you feel that you're going through a time, and where is God? It's like our, our way is just disregarded, and it seems sometimes that hope has disappeared. <clears throat> That's where Israel is. They, their hope has disappeared. And that is who Isaiah is speaking to here. And with his words, and I could have chosen any number of words uh, in Isaiah, because Isaiah 40 through 66 is one of the most uh, hopeful uh, words in all of Scripture. What he is trying to do, he is trying to stir their imaginations so that they can envision something new, something different from the status quo that they are used to in Babylon. 
He is trying to stir them up to recognize that God is doing something on their behalf. He's acting. This is doing something new. There's a, a way being made through the wilderness. Springs are springing up in the wasteland, but they can't perceive it. And the reason they can't perceive it, uh, they can't perceive that future, there's two things that really are hindering them from perceiving it. The first thing is their present ex experience of exile. Um, they have been in exile for 70 years. That's a long time. 70 years they have been in exile and separated from their homeland. In fact, most of the people uh, he is speaking to have probably been, uh, been born in exile. That's all they know. That's all they know is the suffering they have encountered in Babylon. Sometimes a painful experience can go on for so long that we cannot envision anything else. That's, what, that's where they are. We tend, but see, sometimes what we tend to do is we tend to define what is possible by what is. We see that what is, and we think it cannot ever be anything else. That's where they are. They are in that place of, of just recognizing that this is it. But God is doing something else. They can't see it because they are too focused on what their experience is. But there's some, another reason. Isaiah says, so forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. You see, Israel is in exile, and they remember what it used to be like. They remember the glory days. Israel remembered her past and remembered the glory of David and Solomon, where they had an 80-year period where they were one of the most powerful uh, nations in the region. A great wealth. Think of how Solomon's wealth. Israel, to remember is okay. You see, to remember the past and how God has blessed us is a good thing, and it's okay. You know, we're turning the calendar again tomorrow, and you know, sometimes you, you reflect on what 2023 has been like, and you get to a certain age, you begin to reflect on your whole life and, and what that has been like, and you know, it's good to count the blessings. It is good to take stock. But that's not just what Israel is doing, you see. They're looking back to the past with nostalgia and wishing that those good old days could come back to them. They want the things to be the same as they used to be. In Jeremiah, uh, uh, you know, there's people who are going into exile and they say, don't worry, it's not going to last, we're coming right back. But Isaiah, they need to forget, Isaiah is saying, forget the past. You know, they were like Patriot fans who are longing for the good old days when they had Tom Brady. But what Patriot fans need to recognize is Tom Brady is not walking through that door any time now. And neither was David and Solomon. You see, David and Solomon were gone. Those days were gone. And as long as they're looking to the past with that longing to, for the good old days that the way things used to be, well, then they can't embrace with the new thing that God is doing. And as long as they focus just on their present experience, they won't be able to see what God is doing. God was doing a new thing among them. He was doing something that was different from what he had did in the past, and it was going to take them by surprise. One of the things that you read in Isaiah 44 and 45, Isaiah named Cyrus, the Persian uh, king, who would, uh, Cyrus would conquer Babylon. And he would make this great announcement telling the Jews in Babylon that they could go home to their homeland, that they could return. And not only was he, did he say they could return, he was going to fund the rebuilding of their temple. He was going to give them cash out of the treasury. And I was like, what? What a surprise. And you know, John, God works like that sometimes. Jonathan Edwards wrote uh, uh, The Great Awakening. In the, he was a uh, uh, colonial minister. And he, there was a great awakening, a great revival in the colonies. And in 1740, Jonathan Edwards wrote a small, short book on the revival, and he called it a faithful narrative of the surprising work of God in the churches of New England. 
It surprised them. It caught them off guard. They weren't expecting it. And, you know, Cyrus set them free. He said, go back to your homeland. And Psalm 126 said, when the Lord restored the uh, fortunes of Zion or Jerusalem, we were like those who dreamed. They couldn't believe it. It was a, a total surprise. Then our mouths were, taught, were filled with laughter, our tongues with shouts of joy. They were caught by surprise. They did not see it coming. They did, it, it caught them unawares. Now, for those who were here years ago with me, I'm going to tell a story that I told many times over the years. But when I was in seminary, I had a professor. He was a brilliant guy. Brilliant. I read one of his books. And really, his range of thought, he can deal with the you know, New Testament scholars, with the philosophers, but he also has great insight into Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Great range of thought. He was a terrible lecturer. Uh, and the reason was, he, he was a rabbit hunter. Any thought that flittered across in front of him, he would chase it down. And he'd go this way and that way. And first thing you know, his lecture is just going, and you know, you get to the end of the lecture, and you say, what was that? But one day he said something that I perked up. He said, God is run. Now, this is a theology class. And you know, you're learning all the heavy, deep, and real things about the attributes of God and whatnot. And he says, God is round. I said, what? Never heard of that before. He says, well, if you, and he was on a platform, some of this, he says, well, if I took something square, a square block, and just dropped it off the platform, it's pretty predictable it's going to end up right there. But if I took a round ball and dropped it off this platform, it might catch the edge of the step and fly and go this way or that way. And it could go in any direction. Oh, well, that's interesting. I'll write it down. As one of the attributes of God, he's round. Okay. But I never really put it together until about six years later. Some of you will remember Dan Langwa. Okay. And we were at Dan's house. We were having a cookout out there. And, um, a bunch of people from the church. Um, and we got into a game of basketball. And... I threw it in, and Dan's driveway goes like this, and, and we were playing basketball, and I threw a cross-court pass to a big lumbering guy named Steve, and I got by him. He was just rolling a little bit, and Steve, slow-moving Steve, started walking after the ball. But you see, Dan's driveway goes like this, and it reaches a point where it just takes a little dip. Well, slow-moving Steve had no sense of urgency, whatever. But the ball, you see, reached that point where it goes like that. So suddenly the ball is picking up speed. It's going faster. Steve has a little more urgency, so he quickens the pace. But the ball quickens the pace. And the ball gets to the end of the driveway. And because it's round and filled with ear, it does unexpected things. You see, instead of going straight across Milk Street into the, next, uh, the neighbor's yard, it made a right-hand turn. And Milk Street was even more pitched than Dan's driveway. So now it really picked up speed. And Steve, sensing the urgency of the mower, broke into a slow jog. And then the ball just took off. And Steve threw his hands up. And we were just sitting watching. Dan, meanwhile, ran into the house, got the keys to his truck, picked up Steve, and drove a quarter of a mile down the street to get the basketball. And we all just sat and had a, a bottle of water and waited. But it clicked for me right there in that moment. God is round just like a basketball. He will do unexpected things. He will surprise us. He will do things that we don't expect, that we're not looking for. If we have eyes to see, keep our eyes open, God will move like that. Certainly many of the Old Testament heroes found that out. Moses, what was Moses doing? He's walking on the mountain. He's pastoring sheep. And all of a sudden, he sees a bush that catches fire. And Moses goes up to that bush. And, he's, and, Moses, and the Lord tells him, Moses, take your shoes off. You see, they were full of uh, sheep stuff. So Moses, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. 
He says, now Moses, I'm going to send you to Egypt and you're going to bring my people Israel out of Egypt. And Moses says, are you kidding me? Well, take Gideon. The Midianites were overrunning uh, Israel. And Gideon is hiding. And he's trying to hide some wheat from the Gideonites. And the angel of the Lord appears to him and he says, Gideon, hail, mighty man of valor. Valor. And Gideon said, what? He says, I'm hiding. He says, no, I'm, you're going to lead my people in battle. Well, think of David. Sam, the Lord tells Samuel, Dave, I, I've got a new king. Go to Bethlehem, the sons of Jesse. There's a, a new guy there you're going to anoint for king. He tells Jesse, and Jesse starts calling his sons, and he calls seven of them, one right after the other. And not one of them are the, the one. And he says, do you have any others? He said, well, we got this one out in the field. He's passionate. He's really nothing to speak of. And Samuel said, call him. And who was that eighth one out in the field who they thought nothing of? It was David. And the Lord said, this is the one. You know, God surprises us. He catches us unawares. He does things that we don't expect. He does things that uh, go beyond our comprehension sometimes. And certainly no one understood that more than the Apostle Paul. How God's action in the death of resurrection of Jesus shattered his expectations of what God could do and would do. Paul writes to the Corinthians, and originally this sermon was going to be based on Corinthians, but now it's just a little bit. But in 2.12, uh, beginning at 2.12, what Paul is doing in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and he does it throughout the letter, is defending his ministry to the Corinthian church. You see, they had issues with Paul. They, for one thing, he wasn't a great speaker. And great speakers, uh, it was a key thing in, in first century. He wasn't a great speaker at all. He acknowledged that. He said, I did not come to you proclaiming to you uh, the testimony, testimony of God with lofty speech and wisdom. He acknowledged that he wasn't a great speaker. And the Corinthians had probably heard that in Troas, he actually put people to sleep, or some young man to sleep. The kid fell out the window and died. Paul, of course, raised him from the dead. And, you know, if you had to weigh good speaker versus raising from the dead, I'd go with raising from the dead. But they had an issue with Paul. He wasn't a good speaker. He put people to sleep. But they had something else. He suffered too much. I mean, read chapter 10 verse uh, through, through 12, where he lists all the things he had suffered. And, they, and their issue was, how could he be a great apostle when he suffers so much? Look what he do, goes through. Not a great speaker. He's always getting beat up. How can he be God's chosen vessel? Well, Paul says in verses 14 and 15, regardless of their opinion, that Paul and his co-workers are compelled by the love of Christ. And that love has become, since he encountered Christ, that love has now become the driving force of his life. And that love of Christ was manifested through his death and through his resurrection. That he had died his death on the cross for the sins of the world, and he had risen to give new life. But for Paul, that was a surprise uh, to find that God's love could be manifested in Jesus, a crucified Messiah. Prior to his conversion, Paul had a view of Jesus, and he was adamant, this is not the Christ. How could Messiah die on a cross? For all Paul's intellectual power, and he had great intellectual power, he could not imagine that God was doing something so new and so unexpected. Paul's view, you see, was limited to what he expected. He had God in a box. He put all, but all that changed when he got knocked to the ground on the Damascus Road. And he heard Jesus say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. And for, so in verse 16, he writes, From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ 
in this way we no longer do. Paul had now come to see that Jesus was not just some random guy died on the cross, a false messiah, but he was the Lord of all. He had been raised from the dead, and now he was the Lord. And he is writing to the Corinthians, and he's saying, Look, humanly speaking, I, Paul, am not very impressive. You know, I'm not, he wasn't a great speaker. He suffered a lot. Not all that impressive. But you know what? Neither was the cross from a humanly speaking point of view. If we looked at the cross through human eyes, he died one of the worst, worst deaths you could. Crucifixion was not even allowed for a Roman citizen. It was so brutal. Cicero, the, the Roman politician and philosopher, didn't even want it mentioned in polite company. And yet, it was God's way. What a surprise. What a surprise that God should save the, uh, save the world through the cross. And he is asking the Corinthians to consider maybe they were putting limits on God by not recognizing that God's way of salvation and God's way of service were kind of parallel. That is, that God works through the weakness of the cross, but he also works through us who are weak and powerless and, and from the world's point of view can't get anything done. The Corinthians needed to recognize that those who are compelled by God can sometimes surprise you because if God's way of salvation is the lowliness of cross, he also works through those who are weak and powerless. That's who he is. And no one has captured that more uh, in all of literature, I think, than J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is about this power of ring of power, but it's an evil ring as well. It'll consume and destroy anyone who tries to wield it. And the only way it can be destroyed, and it has to be destroyed to, dis uh, to break the spell of evil, is if it is carried back into the land of Mordor, the heart of evil, and cast into the furnace there uh, where, from which it was formed. And, you know, there's all these major players in the story. There's powerful wizards, there's powerful soldiers, all of these really tough guys. And they all say, we'll take it, we'll take it. But the guy who takes it is Frodo Baggins, a hobbit. The hobbits were the most non-persons you could imagine in the story. They lived off by themselves. They were small. They lived in holes in the ground. And nobody ever took note of the hobbits. But it was Frodo Baggins, a hobbit, who carried the ring all the way to Mordor and destroyed it. God works through the weak and the humble and the powerless. He worked through the powerlessness or the weakness of the cross, and he works through the weakness, our weakness, and powerlessness as well. We begin a new year. I am not an optimist, but I am a hoper. I believe in the word of the Lord. I believe that he is the Lord of all, regardless of what is going on around us. He is Lord. Next week, you begin a new chapter in the, his, in the long history of Christ Community Church. Be a hoper. See what God can do. Let God surprise you. Trust in the Lord to do more than you can possibly comprehend or expect, as Paul says in, in, to the Ephesians. Trust in God. Hope in God. Uh, and see what he will do. Let him surprise you. Whatever he does will be a surprise. Catch you off guard. Understand it is not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Amen. So as you walk into nine, uh, 2024, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.